Let's get some analysis on what I've just described to you that's happening in uh, the global parts of the world. We've got expert uh, Dr. Tafadzwa uh, Mabudaudi, who is the University of KwaZulu-Natal from there, rather. Thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, Doc. It is quite a lethal, if you will, situation that is happening um, across the world when it comes to climate change and the extreme weather conditions. We have seen some of that playing out in South Africa, but just for the layman watching and just wants to get a basic understanding of how bad the situation is, how would you describe it at the moment? Uh, thank you very much. I think the situation, uh, um, as the UN Secretary General uh, has sort of indicated, we, we are now in a climate crisis uh, to speak of. And what we are seeing is just the beginning of what scientists have been talking about for many years and warning us about. And we're starting to see those implications manifesting in these heat waves that have been experienced in uh, Europe, North America, and China. Uh, and even here down south, we must understand that for us it's still winter. Our summer is coming. The impact of El Nino has not really been influential as much in the northern hemisphere at this stage because it is still developing but by the time our summer comes uh, you know El Nino will be fully developed so we could expect such intense heat waves uh, and extremes as well in our summer season. Mm. And these weather patterns are very extreme and one wonders the implications of these extremities on food security, for example. We've had issues around that over the last two years or so uh, with uh, supply chain issues from the pandemic, uh, the uh, Russian invasion and climate change also having an impact. How much of that plays into food security? A lot of it actually plays into food security, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where our food security is already fragile and it was already being impacted already by the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis. So with these increasing temperatures and the developing El Nino, what we can anticipate is drought, for instance. We have increasing water scarcity. High temperatures also affect uh, food production. High temperatures also affect, you know, biodiversity bees that we need for pollinating our plants so that we've got food. So if that plays into that food production system and we see decreased yields coupled with the already situation with the Ukraine-Russia war, that would push us into a food crisis where we now have increasing food prices, starvation, hunger, and this is playing out in a region where already food insecurity is, is a challenge. So it's, it's quite serious for Africa in general, I would say. Mm. Now, obviously, Doc, it's not something that can be reversed, but governments can start to act with some kind of emergency to perhaps slow down the dire implications of climate change. What are some of those low-hanging fruits that governments can look uh, to? I mean, we've got uh, the COP27 uh, summit. We've had different conversations across governments in the world, but actionable steps that can be taken. Uh, yes, I think that we, we need to balance two types of actions in, in this uh, situation. We need first actions that hold uh, the emissions, uh, the banning of fossil fuels, actions that hold increasing uh, you know, consumption of fossil fuels, oil, coal. Uh, that is one immediate action. And an acceleration in terms of investments in green renewable energies. Of course, in the context of Africa, we've got challenges that this requires significant investment and significant funding. So again, we need to increase access to climate finance and funding for governments in Africa and the region so that they can you know, start making these agents transition towards a green economy. On the other side, we've got the reality that this is already happening and being experienced, and we need to protect people and the planet. So we need, again, immediate action to understand the vulnerability of people where they are, and immediate action in terms of ensuring early warnings for all so that people you know, are protected. We've seen a lot of deaths 
in the Northern Hemisphere accounted for a lot are yet to be accounted for because the calculations are still being done for excess mortality. So we need to protect vulnerable people through early warning system. We need urgent investments in water and sanitation so that people have access to water to be able to cool themselves off. We need urgent investments in terms of securing the elderly because they are most vulnerable to these sort of extremes. So those are the two urgent interventions, I would say, an immediate halt to you know, increasing emissions and transition to a greener economy, as well as you know, protecting or preventing uh, loss of lives. Uh, Doc, but how difficult would this be to do? For example, in South Africa, and obviously you've had different engagements with various stakeholders, so you'd have a broader view on this. But in South Africa recently, I think it was in March, ESCOM was granted um, an emissions license exemption for Gusile, uh, a, a power station. A and that's as we grapple with our power crisis here. So actions of this nature, these little exemptions, the car power ship controversy that we've seen make the state that you've just described to us a little bit more difficult to implement and I suppose ultimately leave the people, as you say, in a very precarious position. The appetite of government and related stakeholders, Doc, do you think it's enough to change or turn the tide and, and stop with policy changes and implementations like the example that I've just given you around Kusile? You, you raise a very important issue, which is the complexity of decision making and balancing trade offs. So, for example, in South Africa situation, we are faced with an immediate energy crisis, mm. which then immediately threatens our industry and industrialization agenda and job creation. We've got massive unemployment and poverty. So, we need to industrialize, we, or we need industry to continue. We need to ensure investors that we are addressing the energy crisis so that we don't lose out. So there's that aspect. And then there's the second aspect now where we're looking at climate change and saying, but we need to do this in a way that does not create negative impacts on the immediate short-term and long-term viability of South Africa as a country and its people. So how do we balance the need to increase energy generation uh, and secure energy security in South Africa? for those socioeconomic reasons that I mentioned, with the longer-term sustainability. So those are very complex decisions for, for government and decision-makers. And obviously, in this case, they would have gone for the low-hanging fruit to say, but look, we, we already have our coal-fired plants. You know, car power ship is right by the port. Let's bring them online as a short-term solution whilst we figure out what to do. But I would say that we need to be moving away from this, you know, so kind of responsive actions where we are always responding to a crisis and being more proactive and taking actions that ensure longer term sustainability. So there's been a lot of good progress in terms of the independent power producers, uh, the transition towards green and renewable energies. But we need more commitment and action from the government in terms of really opening up that space and also where they put in their investment to increase green energy and renewable energy consumption and also meaningful tax breaks to support consumers and individuals who want to invest on their own so that it has to be a collective action. Government's responsibility is to create an enabling environment where all citizens can then come in and play an active role in supporting this transition towards the greener economy. Mm, very interesting insights indeed, Doc. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, that is Dr. Tafadzwa Mabaudi, who is uh, joining us to speak about climate change and the implications of uh, not implementing urgent changes to protect the lives of people, but also ensure some form of food security as the world grapples with uh, decades of uh, heavy pollution across the world.